the, his opponents also had no plausible alternative candidate to Gorbachev, and there was also a feeling that state funerals of Soviet leaders were becoming an embarrassment. <laughs> that, however, did not stop Russians telling jokes about them. When Cherenka was chosen in February 1984, and was already looking well past his sell-by date, it was joked in Moscow that the Central Committee yesterday unanimously elected Comrade Konstantin Ustinovich Chernyanka as General Secretary and agreed that his ashes would be buried in the Kremlin Hall. <laughs> <laughs> uh, similarly, uh, after Mrs. Thatcher had attended Andropov's funeral at the time and met with his successor Chernyanka, Russians told the story that she telephoned uh, President Reagan and said, you should have come for the funeral run. They did it very well. I'm definitely coming back next year. <laughs> <laughs> and come back, she, come back she did next year for Chernenko's funeral. <laughs> and to re-engage with her new Russian friend, <coughs> Mikhail Gorbachev, whom she had entertained at the Prime Minister's country house checkers just three months earlier. Just after Gorbachev was selected, it was said in Moscow, how much support has Gorbachev got in the Kremlin? Answer, none. He can walk entirely unaided. <laughs> now, six years later, that wasn't a joke, because Gorbachev at that time didn't have so much support in the Kremlin. There was absolutely nothing inevitable about the dismantling of communism 20 years ago. Even dissidents in 1985 did not imagine for a moment that within five years, their political world would have been transformed. My best Czech friend, Rita Klimova, was an economist whom I first met in Prague in 1965. She was expelled from the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia after the Soviet invasion of August 1968 put an end to the Prague Spring. She was allowed out of the country for the first time since 1969 in 1987, and she came and stayed with us in Oxford. In early 1989, the communist authorities reverted to Tyke and refused her permission to come to Britain on holiday. She was very active at that time in the dissident movement. Her home was bugged, and she was under constant surveillance. It's just one small example of how dramatically and how quickly things changed in that one year, that uh, having been refused permission to go abroad on holiday at the beginning of the year, there was just time before the year ended for the new president, Václav Havel, to appoint her as the first post-communist Czech ambassador to the United States. It was Dzita <coughs> Klimova, incidentally, interpreting for her friend Havel, who put the words Velvet Revolution into the English language. And what uh, Rita Klimova told me was that the most that she <coughs> and her friends dared hope for in 1985, following the leadership change in Moscow, was that Czechoslovakia might be allowed to go as far as Kadar's Hungary and achieve a modest economic reform combined with an equally modest cultural liberalization. There was no expectation in Eastern Europe any more than there was in Washington or in Western capitals that Soviet domestic and foreign policy would change fundamentally in the second half of the 1980s. That's the phenomenon which calls for most explanation. <clears throat> a serious contributing factor to the demise of communism in Europe was its relative economic failure. That was one of the long-term reasons for the collapse of communism, though it's of only limited help in explaining why it ended when it did. Certainly, though, the long-term decline in the Soviet rate of economic growth from the 1950s to the early 1980s together with the problem of technological lag, except in the privileged defense sector, were important stimuli for Gorbachev and like-minded reformers. However, there isn't any automatic link between economic failure and the collapse of a regime uh, if an oppressive state is prepared to uh, bring all the forces at its disposal to keep themselves in office. It would be hard to deny that South Korea has been more successful economically than North Korea, but the dear leader, Kim Jong-il, is still in power and in the process of developing nuclear weapons. Regime, regimes which were much poorer uh, than those of the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, such as the Congo, then called Zaire, when it was ruled by Mobutu, 
lasted for de decades longer than they deserved to, and without having such sophisticated systems of uh, rewards, punishments, and surveillance as was available to the Soviet and East European authorities. Over the long term, it's true that market economies, with all their problems, turned out to be more efficient than the command economies of communist states. But if we consider the longer term reasons for regime change, it was not only the relative failures of communist states which were to be their undoing, some of their successes also contributed to the fall of communism. Education, for example, was a success story, but the more educated people were, and especially the larger the higher education sector became, the more dissatisfied they were with the censorship. Fidel Castro, on a visit to Moscow, described Pravda as the greatest newspaper in the world. That may have owed something to the fact that Castro didn't read Russian. <laughs> now, for educated Russians, Pravda was, to put it mildly, an unsatisfactory source of information. And many Russians were increasingly disconcerted by their inability to uh, enjoy the same rights of foreign travel as their professional counterparts in the West. In the Soviet Union of 1939, only 11% of the population had received more than an elementary education. By 1984, the percentage that had received at least secondary school education had risen to 84%. The proportion of the Soviet population who had completed higher education was seven times higher in 1984 than it was just a generation earlier in 1954. It was especially high in Moscow and Leningrad. Well, Karl Marx argued that capitalism contained the seeds of its own destruction. By nurturing a highly educated population, communism planted the seeds of its destruction. Although in all communist parties, the full-time officials wielded far more power than any other group, the highly educated and city dwellers made up a disproportion disproportionately large uh, percentage of ruling parties. The West was important simply by being there and providing a source of alternative ideas. Only a minority of Soviet citizens were able to travel abroad, but that minority included leading party officials. It's said that travel broadens the mind. Um, well, over many years, the long-serving uh, Soviet foreign minister, Andrei Gromyko, was living proof that this does not happen automatically. <laughs> However, travel combined with an open mind could make a huge difference. Gorbachev has said that it was his short visits to West European countries, he visited France, West Germany, Belgium, Holland, and Italy in the 1970s, that opened his eyes to the gulf between Soviet propaganda about life in the West and actual life in these countries. Groucho Marx, not Karl, once said, who are you going to believe, me or your own eyes? Well, Gorbachev preferred the evidence of his own eyes to that of Soviet dogma. Very important also were the ten years that Alexander Yakovlev, who was the second most important reformer of the perestroika years after Gorbachev, very important for him were the ten years he spent as uh, Soviet ambassador to Canada. When he returned to Moscow in 1983, he was much more critical of the Soviet system than he had been a decade earlier. In the long term, as well as at the moment of its demise, communism was also undermined by nationalism. That was always a potential threat to communist rule, although some liberalization of the system was needed before that potential became reality. Its potency was especially great in multinational communist states, and in particular nationalism was never far below the surface in the Soviet Union and Yugoslavia. There were those both within communist states and outside <coughs> who dismissed um, this as a serious threat on the grounds that as compared with economic uh, failure, um, nationalism is a slippery and subjective concept and difficult to delineate with any precision. However, if enough people share a subjective perception, even if it's, <coughs> even if it's based on myth, a all national identity is